On behalf of the East Wall History Group, I'd just like to welcome everybody here this evening. Um, Katrina normally does the hosting for us and she'll be popping back on soon. So I'm going to muddle my way through the technology until we get started. So hopefully we're all good. Um, I have everybody muted at the minute and Ruth is going to do her talk and afterwards we'll unmute people so we can have questions and comments. If you have any uh, questions you want to ask during the talk, you can maybe put them in the chat function and we'll see them, but we will unmute everybody at the end. Um, so I'm not going to say too much about Cannon Hall and the St. Barnabas uh, Utility Society, but today, 100 years ago, was the opening of the first 10 houses in St. Barnabas Gardens. <laughs> These were initiated by Cannon Hall, and Ruth will explain the whole process, but they would ultimately lead on to the building of 170 houses in the East Wall and the North Strand area, and they would inspire thousands more houses around the country, and would also help influence the building of public housing by Dublin Corporation. So Ruth will discuss all that. Um, for people who don't know who Ruth is, I'm just going to read out... Um, a very brief bio of who she is and the work she has done. She's um, an associate professor in geography at the School of History and Geography in DCU. Her books include Dublin 1910 to 1940, Shaping the City and Suburbs, which will shortly be reissued in a new edition, and also Leaders of the City, a co-edited volume on the history of Dublin's Lord Mayors. Building Healthy, Healthy Homes, Dublin Corporation's First Housing Schemes, 1880-1925, co-authored with Joe Brady, will be published by Dublin City Council later this year. She has recently been appointed to the editorial board of the Irish Historic Towns Atlas and is an editor of the Making of Dublin City book series with Four Courts Press. So very impressive history. And again, as people will know, she's probably the leading, or sorry, she is uh, the leading authority on the history of housing in Dublin and, and uh, the country. And as you can see that picture in front of us here, the East Wall History Group was officially launched in 2011 and we had uh, the first ever East Wall History Festival in conjunction with other groups in the area. And our first ever event was commemorating 90 years of Cannon Hall and the St. Barnabas housing. And our very first uh, guest speaker was, of course, Ruth McManus. So that was 10 years ago, which is uh, kind of shocking. And in 2015, we had another celebration of um, Cannon Hall in 1925, there had been a public ceremony held in the area to commemorate the work of Cannon Hall. And on the anniversary of that, we put up a plaque on the side of St. Barnabas Gardens. And again, Ruth was a special guest of that and spoke afterwards. So I think that's um, everything covered from me. Um, and as I said, Katrina will be back on and will um, efficiently um, host during the q a session so without further ado um thanks everybody for being here and uh passes over to ruth thanks joe very much um it's lovely to be here back in east wall even if it's only virtually this time i'm just going to try and get my slides up and running here um so uh today we're celebrating i suppose this centenary um and it's always a pleasure to honor one of my true heroes, Cannon Hall. Um, and what I want to do is to start with the centenary itself. So to go back uh, in time, to take us back to 100 years ago today. And um, I thought I just thought it'd be interesting to see what was in the news. Um, so this is from the Irish Times on the 25th of June, I suppose. So the day after reporting on the events of uh, 24th of June 1921. So what you'll see in the paper is the usual things, the usual ads. So Cleary's and Todd Burns had their summer sales about to commence. Uh, and we also had uh, the regatta, the Dublin Metropolitan Regatta about to start. Um, but uh, there were also a lot of less pleasant things on the horizon. So if we look at the main uh, news items. There's a sort of a summary given in the in the paper, and we have um, two auxiliaries were shot dead on Grafton Street uh, on this day a hundred years ago. Um, bombs, arms, and medical stores found in Mountjoy Square. A bombing of a military lorry 
uh, an attempt to bomb a train, um, a Frahini, in fact, and a troop train derailed in Armagh with um, uh, a number of casualties. So Ireland in 1921 was a very troubled place indeed. And the Freeman's Journal, which is sort of the uh, nationalist uh, newspaper, I guess, uh, whereas the Irish Times would have been seen as being very uh, much a Protestant uh, and unionist paper, um, you can see some of the topics that it featured. Uh, there was uh, an attempt uh, to boycott uh, Belfast trade. Uh, you can see here, buy only Irish goods as well. There was a draper's lockout or strike, depending on your perspective going on, um, and people were being uh, refusing to work in Switzerland, I think it was at the time. And the middle of all of this really bad news, negative things happening, there's this small little item in both papers, which is about this project uh, in East Wall. And here we have the headline in the Freeman's Journal, a commendable project, the scheme for the creation of a garden suburb. So what actually happened this day 100 years ago was that the Lord Mayor came and uh, laid a name stone at what was to become St. Barnabas Gardens. And it was described as what had been practically a wilderness was now being converted into a garden city. And the Lord Mayor expressed the hope that this example was going to be followed. So there's quite a lot of coverage. Uh, similarly, the report in the Irish Times, this, the details are, are pretty much the same. So this is the start of the uh, building. There's an acre of land at West Road, which is going to have 10 houses built on it. And Alderman O'Neill, uh, Lawrence O'Neill was the Lord Mayor. He placed the, the name stone in position and there was a, a, a range of dignitaries. And in fact, uh, we know that there had been a, an open invitation issued uh, to anybody interested in Dublin housing to come uh, and experience this event and uh, to inspect the building scheme as it was described. And the Church of Ireland Gazette was, needless to say, quite pleased um, that a Church of Ireland rector, who we're going to meet in a minute, uh, um, Reverend Hall, should have assisted his men to gather such a number of the important elements of Irish life together in such ha happy harmony. And what they mean by that is that in attendance on this day, and remember all of the things that we've seen that were going on at the time in terms of this very turbulent period in history, they have the local Catholic parish priest, Canon Brady, they have uh, PC Cowan and the staff of the housing department of the local government board, they have the city architect, they have members of Dublin Corporation Housing Committee, they have representatives of local employers like the secretary of the Port and Docks Board, the manager, of the railway, uh, two uh, representatives of two different railway companies, in fact, the harbour master and all sorts of other dignitaries. So this was a, a really big event um, and marking the start of uh, development. The Lord Mayor was actually noted this. He said it was particularly pleasant to find ladies and gentlemen of different degrees and forms of thought and religion gathered together with the one common object of benefiting their fellow citizens. Um, and he hoped that this would be, as he said, a beacon light, uh, the influence of which would spread throughout their beloved land. So this was, by any manner of means, an extraordinary achievement. And it was already being recognised 100 years ago, even before the first house had been completed. Um, so what I want to do this evening, and I'll try not to be too long winded about it, but is to tell you the story of the housing that David Henry Hall calls to have built in East Wall, to explain a bit about the context in which it was built and the lasting legacies of the efforts that were made here that ended up improving not just the well-being of this part of Dublin, uh, but indeed uh, provided, ended up providing housing for people all over Ireland. So I'll talk a little bit first about some of the problems facing the city at the time in the first two decades of the 20th century, and then to talk about this really quite extraordinary story of cooperation that played a significant part in trying to solve those problems. So if we go back um, to the start of the 20th century, this is O'Connell Street uh, from the far end, uh, looking down towards the river, towards the pillar, uh, the GPO you can see there projecting on the right hand side. 
Um, but this scene is not what most Dubliners would have experienced most of the time. Uh, because as you, most of you uh, are no doubt aware, by the early 20th century, Dublin faced a housing crisis. You might say that's uh, still the case. Uh, the second half of the century had seen a lot of upper and middle class uh, people moving out of the corporation area to what were independently governed suburban townships, um, places like Rathmines, Pembroke, and even Clontarf and Drumcondra on the north side. Uh, but they weren't just leaving uh, the, the, the dereliction of the city, the unhealthy squalor of the city behind, but they were also leaving behind their obligations to pay, pay taxes to the city. So the local rates were a really important source of income to the corporation. And because it had losing revenue from rates, it meant that the city authorities were in a really difficult position when they were trying to cope with the slum problem with dwindling resources. Um, the move to the suburbs um, also, of course, had uh, other implications because the former residences of the upper classes were the ones that were being subdivided into tenement houses that were let at high rents in Dublin. Uh, there was a very acute demand for accommodation, um, which meant that there weren't really any incentives for landlords to improve or to rebuild because they were still going to get an income anyway. Sound familiar? Um, and there was very widespread poverty because in general, the local economy was weak. There were a lot of unskilled laborers um, who depended on casual labor. They couldn't pay very high rents. So there were slums evident throughout the city. And I suppose there were slums in many cities at this time. But what made Dublin unique in many ways was, first of all, that there were an awful lot of room tenements uh, and also then that they were not specifically tied to certain areas of the city, but they were found pretty much all over the city. Um, and uh, the problem of people living in single rooms was, was uh, a, a particular problem because um, it led to uh, poor health, uh, spread of diseases like TB in these kind of areas and in ultimately then very high death rates in the city. Um, so this is a map from slightly later, but all I want you to look at are the brown areas on that map and then the black. The black shows us the worst of the tenements, the ones that were unfit for human habitation, but all of the brown represents areas of poor housing. Um, and of course, the hero of our story, uh, David Hall, comes to East Wall not long after the city experiences multiple traumas. Um, the first of which I suppose is the 1913. Uh, first of all, the lockout, this era of terrible unrest. And a lot of people said that the labor unrest, the lockout and uh, all of what followed uh, would not really have happened. And, and certainly they didn't think that Larkin's union would have been as successful. Uh, if the workers had been better housed. Even the uh, Irish Times, as you can see from this quote, acknowledged uh, that fact. And then, of course, uh, two tenement houses on Church Street collapsed in September 1913. Oh, I'll come back to that in a second, um, which caused the deaths of seven people. Now, it wasn't the first or the last time that um, tenements had collapsed, but it because it came at, at such a politically sensitive time, I suppose it drew additional attention to the problems of the city. And it ultimately led to a housing inquiry, which gives us a really good picture of the conditions in the city. Uh, the problems uh, weren't helped, of course, by the structure um, of uh, tenement ownership. And of course, quite a number of members of the corporation were also uh, slum landlords. And here are the slum owners uh, crying crocodile tears um, at the problems of the poor. Um, when the tenements in Church Street collapsed, uh, there was uh, not just local outcry, it was recognized as a problem uh, internationally. Uh, so there was coverage in the press. Um, uh, on the left, uh, we have uh, London, uh, Dublin, a city of homeless people and grief stricken parents. And on the right, we see this was from a Parisian newspaper. Um, so 
little kids uh, sleeping in the streets. Um, so this is the sort of uh, terrible conditions that were in existence just before Cannon Hall or, or at the time Reverend Hall arrives in East Wall. Um, the housing inquiry that was established was quite uh, detailed in, in its, uh, the evidence that it heard and uh, it, it really got a good sense of the as nature and scale of the problems, as well as details of what had been done to date. So they found that there were over 5,000 tenements um, and of those, more than a fifth had only one toilet for between 20 and 40 people. Um, and in general, the housing problem was getting worse. So they said that there were about 27,000 people living in tenements that were structurally sound. But then we had far more people living in second class tenements, which were just on the borderline of being unfit for human habitation. And worse again, there were more than 22,500 people uh, living in houses that were not just unfit for human habitation, but couldn't possibly be improved uh, such that they could be rendered fit. They were just falling apart. Um, so what they found was that um, 60,000 people, 60,000 people needed to be rehoused. And that was a huge task. Um, and it would require three and a half million pounds. It was well beyond uh, the capabilities of the corporation to uh, get that kind of money, the, the, the national government, uh, Westminster, would have to intervene. Unfortunately, of course, what intervened instead was World War. And uh, that gave uh, everyone the perfect opportunity to uh, not do anything uh, about the housing conditions in Dublin. And conditions continued to deteriorate. Uh, we, of course, had our um, rising in the middle of the war. Uh, there was pretty much a, a put to, to construction. So there was a very long hiatus. There was no building practically done. The, the main thoroughfare to be rebuilt, the reconstruction of Connell Street or Sackville Street, and uh, money had to be put into that. And um, there were big issues then about addressing the housing problem. So uh, this map just shows some of the early housing schemes uh, that were undertaken in the city. Um, by the time of the housing inquiry uh, in 1913, the corporation had managed to provide enough housing for about 1,400 people uh, over 30 years, but it now required 14, 000, housing for 14,000 people, or 14,000 houses rather, um, urgently, oops, sorry. Um, so as you can see, most of the development was concentrated in the centre um, uh, up until 21. And we're out here in East Wall. There's nothing really around us. Our part of the city hasn't been uh, addressed at all. Um, so there was housing legislation in 1919, a Housing Ireland Act, which was intended to tackle the nationwide post-war housing shortage. Um, and there were a lot of new powers and responsibilities with that act. But of course, because of the political situation in Ireland at the time, uh, there were almost no houses built. Um, and indeed, Dublin Corporation didn't build anything at all between 1918 and 1921. And they only built 162 houses up until uh, 1925, between 21 and 25. So that's the background. Uh, there's a huge housing need right across the city. Uh, there's a very, on a long-standing, ongoing problems in terms of the structural conditions which lead to poor housing. Um, there is government inaction. Uh, the corporation feels that its hands are tied uh, because of funding issues. Others feel that the corporation isn't doing anything because the, the people in the corporation are slum owners themselves. Um, so it's a, it's a mess. Um, and a very complicated one, what's nowadays known, I think, as a wicked problem. So this is the background to the story of our courageous uh, friend, uh, this Church of Ireland clergyman, David Henry Hall, who is instrumental in founding a cooperative type organisation called St Barnabas Public Utilities Society, which is going to build working class housing for the local population in this area of East Wall, 
but is also going to bring together quite an unlikely combination of people who had some sort of a civic spirit to inspire cooperative housing nationwide. Um, so how did he go about it? What, was it? what were his motivations and what was his legacy? So we've seen housing, uh, poor housing and poverty uh, widespread across the city of Dublin by the end of the First World War. And here in East Wall, conditions were particularly tough. He uh, David Henry Hall uh, was a very learned man and he had spent a lot of time with the Hibernian Bible Society before he was assigned to work in St. Barnabas Parish in July 1918. Um, St. Barnabas Church, this is the Catholic Church on Sheriff Street, and St. Barnabas uh, was down here. Um, it was uh, demolished uh, quite some time ago, um, about a century after it was built. Here it is uh, in its glory. Uh, it was the Mariner's Church. Um, when it was first built. But when uh, Hall came here in 1918, he found some of the worst conditions in the city. Um, the death rate in the parish was 46 per thousand. Now, what does that mean? Well, the city average death rate was 18 per thousand. So 46 per thousand in uh, St. Barnabas Parish. And in Ireland today, uh, the average death rate is six Per thousand, so it was forty-six per thousand in uh, in Saint Barnabas Parish, in East, East Wall. One of the reasons was um, with the high rate of tuberculosis. Um, so the parish was in a heavily industrialised zone, was surrounded by docks, railways, canals, and there was a very high level of overcrowding. And at the same time, there was quite a lot of dereliction. And of course, as you know, Sean O'Casey came from around here, so what he describes in his uh, uh, plays is, is probably quite an accurate description of what this area was like. Um, Hall described one case uh, of a house on Common Street where he found 84 children living in a single house. He described another situation where he found a family of five living in a single room that was nine foot by six. So the, the situations were really extreme. Um, the poverty was appalling and he tried to find a way of um, doing something to help his parishioners. Um, and of course, he couldn't have come to the situation at a worse time, as I've already pointed out. Um, building materials and labour were in very short supply after the war. Building costs had absolutely soared um, as a result of wartime inflation. And the political situation was incredibly unstable. Anybody that Hall talked to tried to put him off. They all said, you are not going to be able to do anything. It's impossible. There is no prospect of success. But you have to hand it to uh, Hall because he resolved he would do his best. He couldn't leave his parishioners in the situations that he found them. So what did he do then? Well, he, he, he tried to find out, well, what, what possibilities, what options are out there? And uh, what he comes up with is this notion of a public utility society. Um, and this is a kind of a co-op. It's a cooperative self-help organization. And they had been used in England in particular um, at a time when housing reform was underway with new ideas around modern town planning and what was known as the Garden City Movement. And these sorts of housing societies were being used there uh, to help to provide housing for, for members on a cooperative basis. Um, in places like Hampstead Garden Suburb in Bourneville, which was, um, of course, uh, developed by the Padbury family, and uh, Letchworth, which was uh, a garden city. And they were all seen as being models of best practice at the time. And uh, there was a sense that um, these would be beneficial, not just in terms of providing housing, um, but that they, there would be better relations involved, uh, the better quality of housing and the ability to build homes, not just houses. And there were similar kind of organizations in most European countries. Now, the idea had been mentioned 
in relation to Ireland, at least as early as 1914, but nobody had attempted to do anything. And indeed, the first legislation, the first um, acts that kind of covered public utility societies don't come in until 1919. And they facilitated local authorities like Dublin Corporation to promote and assist any such society that wanted to provide working class housing. So there is an idea out there um, and that's the background. So enough of that. We know for a fact uh, from what Hall has written himself that in August of 1919, so about a year after he comes to the parish, he had gone to a meeting and heard speakers promoting this concept of forming utility societies to build working people's cottages. And from then on, once he got that idea, he never stopped. He started to research the issue. He was working then from then on to get land on which to build. So eventually he got a site of about three and a half acres uh, for 700 pounds. He called a meeting of the parish in December and he got an architect from the local government board to come along and explain how you could go about building houses for working people. And he himself talked about what he had learned about public utility societies. And as a result of that meeting, now I should say, Hall was really uh, well known as being a very persuasive speaker. He was apparently a magnetic preacher. And I expect that he used those powers of um, persuasion in order to get people to come along with this idea too. Uh, because as a result of this meeting, it was decided to form the Public Utility Society. And that was known as St. Barnabas Public Utility Society, formally registered in January 1920 and Hall was the honorary secretary. There was an eight person management committee and five of those people eventually became residents of the new scheme. And he described it himself as being carried out as a piece of pure citizenship. So this was not about making money or any kind of a profit. Financial gain was never a motivation. So the aim initially was to build 40 houses. Uh, he was going to build semi-detached uh, uh, houses and each house would have a portion of grants. So they'd have a little bit of a garden. And because there was nothing like this in Ireland, it was affiliated to uh, the association in London, which was the Garden Cities and Town Planning Association. And they uh, gave the model rules um, to, to, to start out with sort of a way of, of, of creating this organization. Um, so what they did was they issued a prospectus and then people could um, take out, they, they got a loan stock at 5% and they issued shares of one pound each. So that was the way that they were going to raise money to enable them to start building. Um, so there's no financial motivation. It's intended to be a Christian endeavor to meet and correct some of the appall most appalling housing conditions in the city. Um, and this is our first uh, development then at St. Barnabas Gardens. This is where the foundation stone was laid 100 years ago today. Um, so the first houses then were going to be um, the 10 houses here on the first one acre of ground. ground. Um, it was described as being quality self-help housing for the better class of workmen. And so they were going to have things like hot and cold running water and baths and gardens. Um, and uh, they got, or Hall got Frederick George Hicks to design the houses. Hicks also designed houses in Merino short, uh, shortly afterwards. Um, and as you can see, um, they're using little cul-de-sacs and uh, crescents. Sort of the layout is very much um, influenced, I think, by the ideas of the Garden City movement as well, uh, and quite sort of experimental uh, for the time. So Hall manages to get uh, some money, but there's never enough money, as we all know. Um, so he was always happy to speak and write to anybody who think, he thinks will listen. And this is an example of a letter he wrote to the Irish Times um, saying uh, that there had been a meeting about housing conditions. He describes a situation he encountered. A tradesman and his wife called upon me to inquire about a house. They entered an arson's dwelling 10 years ago with six children. The dwelling had two bedrooms and a kitchen. Since then, 
six more children have arrived, somewhat miraculously, so that the man and his wife and 12 children occupy the two bedrooms and kitchen at night. And sadly, the eldest, the 22-year-old, had been gassed in the war and has to have the kitchen to himself at night. So everybody else packed into two beds in the bedrooms, um, five each in two beds in the bedrooms and three in another small room. So he, he, he wasn't ashamed or uh, to, to write begging letters, if you like, and to try and get people involved. Um, it was going to cost money. Uh, he knew that. And uh, it was going to be very hard to get funding and to build anything in, in such uh, difficult times. Times when there wasn't a lot of money around and when uh, things were being blown up and people were being shot in the street, uh, and yet he set out to get the money. He had to get 25% uh, of the cost of the first scheme upfront because the government would provide loans for the rest, uh, according to the legislation. But the costs were so high after the war, it would cost £10,700 to build the first 10 houses. That was uh, because of the very high cost of building at the time. Um, so they decided on a sort of an experiment, experimental method of walling, which meant that they wouldn't have as much skilled labour on the site. And he also uh, got local firm JNR Thompson to build the houses. Uh, they're based in Fairview. And uh, he persuaded Thompson to start the house. So he went and spoke uh, to Thompson. And Thompson said, well, how much money do you have? have, you, have are, you, are you ready to get started yet? And Hall said, well, actually, I have no money yet but the government will give me a 75% loan. Uh, I just have to raise the 25% first. So I suppose it's testament to both Thompson the Builder and to Hall that Thompson agreed to make, make a start as soon as uh, Hall had got the first thousand uh, pounds. So Hall went out he canvassing, he preached charity sermons, he appealed through the press as we've seen. And in the first week, this just to give an idea of how dynamic he was, he called on more than 300 people, just knocking on doors and looking for money. So he eventually got the, the first thousand pounds at a time when insurrection was likely, in fact, you know, the, the, the political situation was very, very volatile. And indeed, he, he himself described how 67 gallant ladies invested in the scheme when even the Rotary Club failed to support it. So, um, he was always very appreciative to those people who, who had faith in him at the start. So the first 10 houses um, had characteristics of the early garden suburbs. They had this low density cul-de-sac layout. There were 10 houses to the acre, which was very low density when typical houses, I suppose, even the corporation schemes at the time would have been 40 to the acre. Uh, each of the houses had three bedrooms and an indoor bathroom, which again was quite unusual. And they were of an experimental design selected by the women. Now, I don't know exactly what that means, but that was how it was described. And the wives apparently had um, helped planning so that um, the house could be worked conveniently. Um, I suppose it's a sign of the times in some ways that the wife was expected to be looking after the house, but in another, another sense, the fact that they actually included women at all in the planning process was quite radical. Um, so the idea was there were six houses with five rooms and uh, then uh, four four-roomed houses and the tenants paid a weekly rent and part of that money was going towards buying out their homes. So it was a purchase rent. So the money uh, was being invested in uh, which would yield a return that would also help to benefit the purchasers. So the aim was that the, the members of the society would be able to buy out over time, they would be able to buy out a comfortable home over a period of 20 years between the tenant purchase and the shares that they had in the society. So every pound that was subscribed gave a person a share in the society. And over time, um, the value of those shares would also rise. Um, it's kind of, I won't go into the, the, the financial uh, details of it, uh, but it was quite a clever way of enabling people to uh, buy their own homes. And this was something that Hall was really keen on. And this was something quite new as well at the time, uh, this idea of a purchase scheme. There had been mechanisms like this used in the UK, um, whereby 
ownership would be gradually transferred from the non-tenant shareholders who took the main risk at the start of the scheme to the tenant shareholder who would eventually become the ultimate owner. And Hall, Hall had great faith in people, I think. Um, and at the same time, he recognized that in order for people to truly value something, they had to earn it in a way. So what he said was that deep in man's nature, there's an ingrained contempt for what can be secured without labor. So he didn't believe in handouts, but he wanted to make it possible for people uh, to gradually make uh, payments so that they could become a full owner of their house. So, so he said that if, if somebody earns something for themselves, they, they, they value it more. And he wanted to make it possible uh, for them to, to be in that uh, position. So um, oh, we've already kind of covered this. This is what's going on in the country at the time when uh, this good news stories comes out about St. Barnabas, the first 10 houses about to be uh, built. So, and I think I've already covered this also, uh, the motivation being very much inspired by his uh, Christian faith. Um, he was really interested that everybody uh, who was interested in housing should get the opportunity to learn from what he was doing. And that's something that persisted uh, throughout his, his activities and really for the rest of his life, he continued to speak about housing and trying to explain uh, what could be done. So the first 10 houses, um, this is a slight cheat because these aren't St. Barnabas houses, um, but it's pretty much the way that those houses would have been built and the kind of uh, working uh, conditions for housing workers at the time. So the first 10 houses were actually occupied by December 1921. So here we are in June. Uh, the first two houses are under construction. The rest is just uh, building ground. But by December, there are people living in those houses. So that meant that the society started to be, uh, obtain revenue. And that meant that they could start to pay dividends uh, to the shareholders. And uh, they could start to plan the second phase of development. Um, and the second phase was for 26 houses uh, on a two and a half acre site, and they were able to uh, reduce the costs of uh, because building costs were stabilizing somewhat. Um, so that was Utility Road and Utility Gardens, where are now Strangford Road and Strangford Gardens. Um, but one of the things I want to just say while this slide is up um, is that the building scheme also provided much needed local employment for building workers. And that was a great boost to the whole community. And in fact, that was always being used as an argument to develop housing schemes um, and similarly road schemes in the 20s and 30s. Um, and uh, Hall loved telling the story about his relationship with the, the building workers because when the chimney of the first house was completed, the workers put up a red flag on the roof. And that was a kind of a custom that they'd get a tip, uh, their desire for refreshment, as Hall put it. So the tradition would be that uh, the foreman would, would be given uh, money uh, that would be given to the workers for a treat. And um, Hall went up, he was extremely nervous because he didn't have very much money, as, as, as you're aware. Um, and he was afraid he'd, he'd precipitate a strike or something that the workers would be ins insulted. Um, and uh, he was extremely touched by the response because when he went uh, to speak to the foreman and to give him the small sum of money, he found that the workers had asked the foreman to tell him that, and, and this is his own quote, that they recognized our hard effort in raising money and that they were grateful for the work while so many were idle and that they would take no money, but only asked for more work. So they didn't want his money. They were just appreciated being there. And he was very generous in his praise for the workmen, for their cooperative spirit and their attempts to work faster and to, to try and help the scheme uh, to, to, to get going. And I think that was, again, indicative of the kind of person that Hall was, that he, he seemed to be the person who could get the best out of anyone. 
He got the goodwill of all sorts of different people and bodies. He got the Builders Federation on side. He got the ministry, the Ministry for Local Government and Public Health, the corporation, uh, the operatives in the building trade. Um, and as it was said, to an extent, to shows how much the disinterested service of one's fellow man appeals to all sorts and conditions of men. So people um, resonated with, with his ideas. And his drive and enthusiasm were such that he succeeded in building houses at a reasonable cost at a time when almost no building operations were taking place. And he was able to galvanize people into action. So the second scheme here, uh, Utility Road, Utility Gardens, as I've mentioned, uh, was built then once that the first scheme had been completed. Um, and uh, the corporation was very helpful as well because they installed the water mains that were needed free of charge. And they also made a grant equivalent to the cost of the rates uh, for a 10 year period. So that really um, took away quite a lot of financial uh, challenges, um, I guess. So, so by the, the next stage, um, they were able to report that things within the society were going pretty well. Um, the um, school registers um, uh, are really interesting because they give us an idea of um, some of the people who were living in the scheme. Now, the St. Barnabas Utility Society was particularly special because it was a, an ecumenical undertaking. Um, it's associated, of course, with the Church of Ireland parish of the same name, but from the very start, it was not intended to be sectarian in any way, uh, which is all the more remarkable when you think of the troubled times in which it originated. So all denominations were present within the shareholders and among the prospective tenants. And there was also tenant control over the society because there was a tenant dominated management committee they were the ones who managed the houses and who approved the tenants. And as it was said, tenants were taken as the cane once they satisfied the requirements of the committee. So if we look at the first 36 houses, we know that 15 of the families were Protestant, 21 were Catholic. Um, now, most of them were foremen or they were skilled workers because the early schemes uh, scheme, the rents were relatively high. They had to be because of the building costs, of, as we've seen. Um, but this is some of the reg school register information. Um, so these are uh, some of the pupils in the local school. And you can see uh, utility gardens here, Clark, um, and this one, uh, child here, uh, their father was a police constable. Um, and in fact, I think the profile of the residents then, these are the kind of jobs people had, a motorman, a soldier, a carpenter, a railway porter. Um, uh, the other thing I suppose that uh, a lot of people uh, in East Wall are very proud of is uh, the other things that went with not just the houses, but the fact that there was a recreation ground provided with a hard tennis court, uh, open space and a sandpit. And the opening ceremony for that took place in uh, September 1923 by the time the first 36 had, houses had been completed. And the president of the Rotary Club, um, Mr. McConnell came along and uh, they were again, very appreciative of the development um, and the great community spirit uh, that was in evidence in um, the area. Um, so um, McConnell uh, talked about um, the goodwill uh, which uh, had meant that the present enterprise had reached a successful conclusion um, and that everybody, not just the tenants, but the whole city of Dublin should congratulate Mr. Hall and Mr. Leach, that was the chairman of the society, because they had proved that this thing could be done. And um, if they could improve the conditions under which the people lived, they helped to create a happier and more contented community. So part of creating that contented and happy community was uh, to provide them with recreation. And so uh, there were all of these wonderful uh, facilities provided. And Hall was very anxious, he said, that people would play games that would uplift and improve them. And he thought that tennis did that. I'm not sure if he saw the recent shenanigans uh, 
in tennis world, he would be too impressed. So over time, then Lady Ardalon uh, presented gifts of further tennis courts, a pavilion that was the Nissen Hut, and a piano for the enjoyment of the tenants. And other people from as far away as Dalgany and Athlone donated plants and shrubs and hedging, fruit trees and so on for the gardens. Um, and Hall was absolutely delighted with this because they really added to the character of the area. And there was an annual competition, which is what's on the, on the page there, uh, for the best gardens. Um, and uh, indeed, a, a really remarkable community spirit evolved. So this is the report, I think, of McConnell and the Mrs. McConnell, his daughters, uh, who visited uh, the gardens and uh, gave marks for neatness, utility and variety. So um, and you can see uh, the names of some of the uh, winners um, and um, there were votes of thanks and all the usual uh, such uh, things that happened at these events, including uh, tea at the end, which is always a good thing. Um, so that, there are first two, that's the, the 36 houses. And then things uh, stepped up um, because by mid 1924, the society had got more land and was prepared to build again. So there are 62 five-roomed houses then at Seaview Avenue and Crescent Gardens. Again, described as being for better class, better class workmen with a bath, hot water, gardens. Now they cost five hundred and fifty pounds over time, as we've seen through tenant purchase. But that was forty pounds cheaper than the least expensive corporation house at the time that didn't have a bath and didn't have hot water. Uh, so they were definitely uh, far superior. Um, and uh, they were actually in appearance more similar, I suppose, these ones to the corporation houses because of the, they were terraced, they were built of concrete blocks with asbestos roof tiles, dare I mention, um, and they were quite similar in appearance to the Merino houses that were also designed by Hicks. The very last scheme uh, on the other side of the railway line, uh, the houses were a bit smaller. Um, it was becoming a bit more difficult to get funding. I think corporation is starting to up its game a bit and um, perhaps the uh, underlying demand in the area is reducing. Um, so the 73 four-roomed houses built. And again, Jane or Thompson, our old friends, are building the houses. They cost £449 each. Um, it's interesting, the auditors of the society noted in 1926 that there were no rents in arrears. And that just tells us something. The tenants' own selection process was very effective. The tenants took responsibility for their homes and made sure to be able to pay for them. So this is probably, if you think about it in, in pure numerical terms, it might seem like a small number of houses. But this first public utility society was extremely important. It provided an example for others to follow. And this concept of a public utility society would spread across the country. And that's really, again, down to our friend Hall's tireless promotion of the idea. So we see uh, uh, organizations being founded in rural and urban areas. And eventually it got a bit too much for him. So the Civics Institute of Ireland uh, took in hand the sort of the formalities of the process, but people always turned back to Hall and asked him for practical guidance. So he was involved, involved in a direct or an advisory capacity in establishing many of the early societies, including the Linen Hall and uh, Dublin Commercial Public Utility Societies. And he, he persuaded the, the church representative body uh, to take loan stock in a number of societies too. He was involved in 1932 with the Roman Catholic parish priest of Fingus in the formation of St. Canis's Public Utility Society. So again, continuing this ecumenical uh, approach. And the second active public utility society was actually only up the road in Colester. Um, so very much directly influenced by Hall's work and by the experience of what they could see happening in East Wall. Um, the idea, the concept of the Public Utility Society became prominent from the mid-1920s when um, 
more settled uh, political conditions and new housing legislation made it possible to really get going on building. And uh, there were new grants and rates for missions made available for all housing that conformed to particular specifications. And all of that legislation in 1924, 1925 uh, gave public utility societies the same level of grant um, as local authorities, whereas private individuals got a lower uh, level of um, grant and rate remission. So that was really a milestone in recognizing the value of these societies. Um, so it was a very deliberate government policy then as well to encourage people to join these societies. It believed that they would be of great assistance in house production. And indeed, it, it led to the foundation of quite a number of societies, um, not just in Dublin, initially in Dublin, but then across the country. Um, Hall's uh, work included um, also becoming involved in the Citizens Housing Council and the Association for Housing the Very Poor. So he wasn't just promoting public utility societies, but he was also doing anything in his power to try and address uh, the problem that he saw around him. Um, so he was, as you can see here, actively involved. He was on the executive committee, here he is, of um, the uh, Housing Week, which took place in 1925. So it was the Central Housing Council, which was all about rousing the public to a sense of the urgent need for building houses for the working classes. What are the best methods of doing this? How do you go about forming public utility societies? So this is Hall, again, uh, doing his utmost to spread the word. Um, here's the Linen Hall Public Utility Society, 1926. You can see there um, up at the back of the King's Inns, and that's the uh, original nameplate. So Hall was the president, president, I think it was, of, of Linen Hall. Um, and of course, then further organisations uh, were developed on these lines. So at the, at the scheme in Merino, uh, the corporation made land available at the edges on the main frontages. Um, and uh, the first land that was developed was by the Dublin Commercial Public Utility Society that Hall was involved in getting set up. And um, it built houses on the Malahide Road frontage of the scheme. They don't look quite like uh, the ad, in fact, uh, that's more what they look like. Um, the Dublin Co Co Commercial uh, became an extremely successful organisation. I'll say a tiny bit more about that again. And um, we can see then um, quite a number of societies were established specifically for civil servants, as this one, Sarah's thought, these are houses on Home Farm Road in Drumcondra. Uh, and the idea of the Public Utility Society um, really became popular. It was seen because it was a very flexible model. Um, so quite a lot of different types of organisation, social groups got involved. You had dreamers, you had planners, you had philanthropists, you had employers, you had trade unionists, you had politicians, you had clergymen, all, uh, and, even, and also women finding a role in organising these societies. Um, but it, it provided uh, an opportunity for what was seen as being public spirited investment. Um, and uh, Cowan, who was from the local government board, said that it encouraged manly conduct and good citizenship. Don't ask me what manly conduct is, but uh, that were, they were his words. Um, but the, the government um, and certainly the department which dealt with housing by 1933 had recognized the value of this way of going about building um, and uh, suggesting that it's this sort of activity that is the only way that we are going to solve the poor conditions that so many people uh, are uh, suffering uh, right down into the 30s. Uh, of course, was, there was a huge uh, 
slum clearance uh, process underway right across the country uh, after 1932. Um, so Hall's work and his, his idea and his perseverance led to the development, first of all, of St. Barnabas Public Utility Society, which built more houses than the corporation did at the same time. Um, so for that short period in the 1920s, St. Barnabas built more houses than the corpo. It also uh, led indirectly to the development of Dublin Co Commercial Society, which became renamed as Associated Properties, which became the largest house building organization in the Free State. Um, after 1932, public utility societies were very active in rural areas. Um, most of their activity seems to have been before the Second World War, but there was another surge of interest after 1948 legislation. Um, but in the 20s and the 30s, sort of, I suppose, in the directly linked to, to Reverend Hall period, there were over 17,000 such self-help houses completed. So it, it was hugely significant and I suppose inspired an ongoing interest then in what's nowadays known as social and affordable housing. So the nice thing I suppose was that in his own lifetime Hall was recognized uh, for his work and this, here he is with uh, his wife Olive Edith who was a Galway woman and they had been presented with a motor car which was a remarkable thing, I suppose, at the time. And just a, a, a signal, I suppose, of the esteem in which he was held locally. Um, since the first time I spoke about Hall in East Wall, I, I got a, an email uh, out of the blue uh, from somebody in the UK who was in the ownership of this clock, which he had bought from a restorer, a clock restorer in Nottingham. So we don't know how it got there. But it had been presented to Hall uh, in 1929 by the tenants as a mark of their appreciation and esteem. So in 1929, Hall was moved uh, from uh, East Wall, from St. Barnabas Parish. He was moved on uh, to Glenageary and he lived out the rest of his life in Glenageary. He died suddenly in 1940. In, uh, in, in, in the parochial house in Glenageary. Um, but I suppose we've seen really how his legacy lives on. This little part of Dublin occupies a unique position then in Irish history because the work of, he became a canon of Christ Church in 1931. That's why he's known sometimes as Canon Hall. So the work of Canon Hall and his parishioners, I should mention, he didn't do it all alone, in creating the St. Barnabas houses was a remarkable feat in the context of the time. And we've seen that individuals from across the religious divide were working together. They were contributing to shaping the city by building new quality housing and providing much needed employment. His perseverance, I suppose, shows us that with the right motivation and with a sense of citizenship and with a faith in what can be done, we can achieve what seems to be impossible. He made a really meaningful contribution to the housing situation in Dublin, uh, not least by showing that ordinary people could make a real difference. Drive, determination, citizenship and goodwill could achieve much, even where only a handful of individuals were involved. So maybe that will give us all a little bit of hope for the housing future of Dublin. So thank you very much for your attention today. Thank you so much, Ruth, for that um, enlightening presentation on our uh, local housing hero, Cannon Hall. Um, and it's been uh, really, really interesting as usual. Um, I think if we can learn anything from the past, then there's so much that we can learn from 
the building person, especially in the current times, as you alluded to there. And it's so fitting, Ruth, that you are you yourself are given this presentation, given that you gave our very first one uh, so many years ago, um, and that it's the 100th anniversary as well. So as usual in our talks here, we're going to open the floor to questions. And in particular, we'd like to hear if any people have memories of stories of growing up in the area or any comments that they would like to make on the presentation itself. So we'll open the floor up to people now, if that's OK. I, I just to say one, I want to say that was great, great talk. But just given that it's the 100th anniversary, people might like to know that the circle is about to close because Thompson's, who you mentioned, were the builders. Their site, the, their yard, was the area behind where the fire brigade is now on the North Strand Road, which later people would probably know better as the Roadstone site. And about a month ago, the first tests were undertaken on the actual soil to see if there's any contamination. Based on the results of those, that site is going to be developed as social housing. And I've already got the speak in, so to speak, that some, whatever they're gonna call it, that whole should be commemorated in some way as it's the final piece in the jigsaw, jigsaw if you like, of all the sites that he developed. Fantastic, Hugo. I really hope that you can make that happen. That would be just such a lovely tribute. Although I do think that in East Wall, people have been really good at commemorating mm. the story. I think it's an amazing story that people just don't really know um, and should be known better, you know? Thanks for that, Hugo. Um, have we any other questions? We're getting a lot of nice comments about what a fantastic presentation it is, uh, Ruth. Can I jump in with a question, Katrina? Yeah, sure. Right. Um, Ruth, you mentioned that Cannon Hall had um, come across the idea previously at a meeting about utility housing. Um, do you know exactly where that was? And also, we also had Walter Carpenter living in the area who had spoken at the Housing um, Commission in 1914. And he had taken part in meetings about garden, um, about the garden societies. Um, so do you know, the, one, do you know where the meeting was? And did our paths ever cross that you're aware of? That's a great question, Joe. I wish I knew the answer to either of those two questions. Um, there's a lot, there's a lot that we don't know. Um, the um, he I never found out where he went to the, the, that meeting in, in 1919, but there was there was a lot going on. There was a lot of discussion, I suppose, really from about 1910, like 1910 was the first time that the idea of Merino being used for a, a, a garden city, a miniature garden city, I think was the, the phrase that was used at the time. That was the first idea that that the first time that that, that idea was mooted. So there's. There's a lot of interest in ideas about planning, modern town planning in particular, this idea of the Garden City was seen as being, people were latching onto it as maybe being a way of solving the housing problems. Mm -hmm. and, um, there were a lot of different organizations and, you know, that came and went. There were also visiting ex ex exhibitions and various, um, I suppose, fairly well-known uh, people coming over from England and Scotland speaking um, about these ideas. So, uh, which of those ones? Uh, I might I might try another trawl through the newspapers and see if I can find reference to a particular meeting. You might just be lucky to see oh such and such an organisation met in 1919. But I, I I'm afraid I don't know uh, the answer to that. Um, all the time, though, more information is becoming available. The Church of, if anybody's interested, the Church of Ireland Gazette now has been digitized. And there's actually a wonderful um, anniversary piece about St. Barnabas Church, which mentions Hall as well in it. There is, um, you know, so, so there's more and more sources 
still coming on stream, which I think maybe will help us to answer some of these questions down the line. Thank you. Um, we have a comment here from Nick O'Shea saying he has seen the same house typology as St. Barnabas built in Sandy Mount called Seaford Gardens and Dunleary called Rosary Gardens. Do you know if they have any connection to the East Wall houses? Yeah, um, actually somebody else, I think it was my aunt, actually mentioned to me that she thought that the houses looked like the ones in Sandy Mount and I had, hadn't copped it until now. Yeah, those those Seaford Gardens, I think, were built uh, for, I'm almost sure they were built um, for returning soldiers after the war. They were actually, they predated the Soldiers and Sailors Land Trust, but they were sort of just <coughs> ahead of them. So it's, I think they were um, built by the Office of Public Works. I don't know about the ones in Dunleary, so I'll have to go and do a bit more routing on that. Um, it's quite possible that the connection is the architect Hicks, Frederick George Hicks, who would have been pretty active at the time and may, may well have, have been involved in, in those schemes. But I'll, I'll take a note of that, Nick, and I'll, I'll, I'll do a bit of rummaging. And uh, if I find anything more, uh, I'll get back to you through, through Joe and Katrina, maybe. Okay, and we have um, Marie Broderick saying Cannon Hall left a wonderful ecumenical legacy. Uh, Marie, would yourself or, or Angie mm -hmm. like to make a comment on what it was like to grow up in that in that particular area? No pressure. Uh, yeah, gotcha. Go on, go on, Angie. Off you go. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just saying that, that we had a great childhood because of Cannon Hall. And we had the tennis court and it was very funny in the middle of the city that these kids in East Wall had their own private tennis court. And I have great memories of um, playing up in the, in the tennis court. The grass court had overgrown, so we kind of had a field to play in. And then the hard court was still there. So we were going around with our tennis rackets. <laughs> and, you know, when the kids were playing football in the streets and that, we had our tennis court and our tennis rackets. And I also remember Mr. Vincent, who was the secretary of the Utility Society. And he had an office on the grounds. And when we were playing up there, it started to rain. We'd ask him if he could go in. And he would let us go in. And we'd sit around. He had a paraffin fire and a paraffin heater. And we'd sit around that and we'd be talking. And, and every now and then he'd look over his glasses and he'd say, quiet now, children. And, you know, he's like, God, he's, you know, he was kind of a bit narky with us, but when you think about it, the man should have really told us to go home. But I think he actually enjoyed the kids coming in and enjoyed the company. But our, the legacy that we got from Cannon Hall is that it was the ecumenical legacy, really, in that we grew up Catholics and Protestants. We were all the same. I didn't, I didn't realise till I went to school that I was a different religion, you know, and even after we went to school, we still went to the you know, Protestant, we went to church in the Protestant church, we went to the girls brigade, boys brigade displays, the um, all the, the choir practices and choral performances in St. Patrick's Cathedral. So it gave us, um, we were kind of a little in little oasis here. I, I thought the whole country was the same. It wasn't until we looked back that we realized that we had an oasis in the middle of a lot of sectarian turmoil in this country. And that's a legacy of Cannon Hall. Thanks a million for that, Andrew and Marie. Um, and, and yeah, and, and just just on, on, on that point, like um as like the, the tennis courts were there until I was probably about 15 or 16. And yeah. uh, we we all like as part of our youth club went out and played tennis during the summer on those tennis courts and I was a pretty good tennis player in the day <laughs> but um I'm you know, sure and, you know. And, <laughs> I probably haven't <laughs> but um and again like that we took it for granted that tennis was the thing that you just did you know when you were a kid that you could go around to the tennis court with your tennis racket and and, and play a game of tennis and 
like Angie said there, you, you don't realize that these things are not the same everywhere. So, so thanks for reminding me of that. Now, does anybody have any other comments or uh, questions to ask? I'm trying to send Zoe here for now. Sorry? Can we put her set <laughs> Oh, you can. Things. oh you can, yeah, you can go back into the left hand corner and click the mute button. Ah, oh, grand, thanks. If Angie would like that, that is. <laughs> uh, so has anybody got any other questions uh, that they might like to ask Ruth or any memories that you'd like to share? I know we have a couple of residents in here at the minute, if any of you would like to talk about it or, or um, if any of the neighbours growing up would like to talk about it. That would be great. Um, if not, don't worry about it. I think Etna has her hand up there, does she? Mm. I'm sorry about that, Etna. I didn't see you. Uh, you know how to unmute yourself if you go into the left hand corner of your screen. <coughs> Can you see it? Yeah. No, I just wondered um, what houses were actually in East Wall at the time. That was just the site where the Cannon Hall houses were built, was it? Just an empty site. There was nothing on it already. Yeah, there was actually quite a lot of empty ground. I don't know if you remember. I had a map there uh, near the start. Um, at the very beginning. That's probably the, what. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there was actually quite a lot of unbuilt ground, and um, the corporation did have its eye on it. Like it was thinking about maybe sometime yeah. uh, it's going to build something. So they had. Um, sort of after the first world war they were thinking about building in sort of the north lots and all of that mm -hmm. which eventually gets done but not until much later so so there were quite a lot of uh, of open there was open land there was derelict land then there was some it was kind of a strange mixture because it's it's that sort of semi-industrial landscape and then there's lots of you know there's the canal and there's the um the railway lines and then there's a lot of uh really small little overcrowded uh courts and laneways down uh near the river you know in that end uh, yeah. which were really notoriously overcrowded um and uh very high death rates um so that's some of the area that i think really inspired uh, hall he also noticed that people were having problems actually getting housing so some of the workmen were staying in lodgings away from their families. And that was something that he, he didn't like, you know, he thought people, you know, families should be together where possible. So, so to try and provide the right kind of housing for people as well what was part of his, his aim. Well, they certainly were better and much improvement on the red brick houses that would have been on Caledon Road, for instance, or, you know what I mean? Because they don't, wouldn't have had sanitation inside, you know, so. Yeah, but even a lot of middle class houses then, you know, were only starting to get sort of modern conveniences. Mm -hmm. um, so it was and, thinking. Yeah, yeah, thank God. Absolutely. Especially we haven't got somebody like him now. <laughs> yeah, I, I often think that like, because he was only one person and he wasn't even like housing wasn't his first thing. His, his, he, he was a very, a man of really deep faith and very, like he read the Bible in all its original languages, mm -hmm. really learned person. Um, but he said, well, you know, how can I expect people to be worrying about God and faith and everything if they're living in these awful conditions? So I have to do something practical about it. Yeah. And, and he kind of learned about how to go about doing it. And that, that's what I think is so admirable about him. Okay. And we have um, the Brodericks have their hands up again, or is that? You can unmute yourself there. Yeah, can you hear us? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to say to Ethna that our house on West Road was built in 1905. And my father can remember, my father would talk about there was nothing between our house on West Road and the houses on Church Road. Yeah. But they were all fields right across. Mm. And we have a photograph of my grandmother taken out in the lane. And they hadn't built the wall. They were still in, in the process of building yeah. the houses there on Spankford Gardens. 
So I don't know all the hands, but I presume they were the same period and ours was 1905. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. I know a lot of the houses are over 100 years old. The houses yeah. on um, St. Mary's Road at the end towards the hill, they'd be over 100 years old, you know? Yeah, and some of the people living in them are nearly 100 years old as well. <laughs> you won't mention that. <laughs> so it's, that's because they used to all the lovely place, Marie. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Um, and if it helps, that, then like I'll put up links um, on the Facebook page to some maps. Um, I know myself and Ruth share this love of, of maps and there's some fabulous collections there. The, UC, the collection in UCD gives a lovely set of maps um, in really high resolution. So I'll put up the links there and you can see exactly what was there. It's certainly from the 1840s, 60s anyway. Have we any other questions? Or comments? Can you see me? I'm dying here. Um, no, just to say thank you very much to Ruth. Yeah. yeah. Because she's just fantastic and it was a brilliant presentation. And very much and appreciated. And thank you to the History Society for organising it. Oh, well, well, Ruth was the first person we turned to on the 100th anniversary of anything to do with Cannon Halls because she, she really knows her stuff. She's fantastic. You're right. Um, so, I, I, Brian, do you want to ask a question? Yes, Sorry about that. Not at all. Um, thanks very much for the opportunity. I'd like to say, first of all, how much I enjoyed the presentation. Uh, it was absolutely fabulous. Um, I was born uh, in the corporation and reared in the corporation estate on Shelmanlea Road and uh, lived there till I got married, which was some time ago. And uh, I was a member of the uh, the boys club, the youth club, and we uh, had our meetings in the Nissan hut. Um, tennis courts were finished at that stage or else we weren't let play on it. You know, we always considered the people around St. Barnabas Gardens to be wealthy. <laughs> wealthy Protestants and, and you know but we passed by uh, the club every single day on our way to school and the gardens were absolutely lovely and in our school in the French Sisters of Charity in North William Street um, there was usually a May altar and we were always told to bring some flowers for the for the May altar in the school and of course we didn't have any flowers nor could we buy any flowers on so we used to steal them out of the gardens in St Barnabas's and bring them into the teacher and into the nuns okay. and the, the May altar always looked fabulous <laughs> uh, that was one kind of uh, history I have or one memory of it of course the Nissan hut was also used as a, a clubhouse for uh, the footballers there was a great football team down in East Wall at the time mm -hmm. there were several teams you know um, and they had the things that called the street leagues. We never played tennis and we wouldn't have a, te a tennis racket. But we played plenty of football on, on the streets and had the street leagues. And our meeting place was in the um, in St. Barnabas in the, in the Nissan hut. And there are some photographs. I, I presented some some years ago, pictures of the, uh, the men's team. Um, for want of a better word, I, I want to be trying ecumenical here, but it was a Protestant based team. And uh, there were some photographs of footballers back in the 20s and also uh, photographs of the uh, of the, the clubhouse itself, the Nissan Hut. Didn't realize until I was listening to the talk that the uh, Lady Arderlon had, had any connection with it. Mm. So it's nice to have those things brought up. Just to say how much I'm intrigued by the actual the, the, the presentation and the talk, and I've enjoyed it very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the opportunity of just passing a few comments. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think, um, uh, isn't there a plaque there to, was it Ben Hannigan? No, yes, it's not Ben Hannigan. Ben. No, there was a Fuller. Fuller? Yeah. Hubert Fuller. Hubert Fuller, who set up the street leagues, mm -hmm. if I remember right. That's right. Um, the, Sorry. Girl guides, the Catholic girl guides also met in the Nissan hut. Yeah. If yeah. anybody, if anybody, Ekna, were you in the guides? No. <laughs> you mentioned, well, the girl guides met in the Nissan hut as well. 
Mm. I was. And when did they change over, Angie? Because I was in the Girl Guides and we met um on Mary's Road in where the Penny Dinners place was. Mm -hmm. Hey, I would just see, but I was in the Girl Guides as well. It was up in the Nissan Road. Well, he, so joined the old. he joined the Girl Guides in 1906. <laughs> right. <laughs> No, but no, I'm just saying that. So it just look like that. <laughs> and that's what you're saying with the, the football teams. With um, I think you're talking about the one now that would have Mr. Pickett, Nicholas Pickett in the sea view, right? You know, you know, and they but it wasn't um, there always was this idea that it was Protestant, that you know, this area was Protestant and wealthy, but it wasn't at all. In fact, like it was a mix. I think the first house, I think Ruth would and confirmed that the first house actually went to a Catholic. Very and good. that was the whole thing that he wanted he wanted he wanted to create an ecumenical society and that he did. But it was just around this area, but it wasn't there's all the same always the idea that it was Protestant, but it, it, it wasn't. You know, it was a mix of Catholic and Protestant. Mm -hmm. And the other thing about as you're saying about the gardens, they had um the society held competitions. So there was fierce competition over the gardens, and that's why the gardens were always so nice, because they had a competition for somebody won Garden of the Year every year. So that's why the gardens were a big thing. Yeah, they also had um, the harvest festivals uh, in St Barnabas's Church. Yeah, every, yeah every right. September, and uh, the presentations there were uh, they were absolutely magnificent. Of course, yeah. we were told that we couldn't go into a place like that at that time. And for different well, It's funny you should say that because you know, I know it's, it's much later. There was a lady here at the time, I'm sure you remember Mrs. Pickett, do you? That lived in Stranker Brian, Gardens. Brian would know Mrs. Pickett. Mrs. Pickett, yeah. number one, Stranker Gardens. She was actually a founder member of the Ladies Club and she was Church of Ireland. She died in 1976 and it was Father Burke who was down at the church mm -hmm. in East Wall. And he asked, at that stage, Barnabas Church was gone. So she was, uh, her service was in the North Strand Church. Mm -hmm. And Father Burke asked if he could participate at the service, which he did. And when you think, to, to us, that was perfectly natural. But in 1976, when you think of that and what was going on up the North in 1976, mm. we really were in an oasis. In, in the context of, of what was happening yeah. in the country. And there we were in North Strand. And we had the parish priest with the clergyman on the altar for Mrs. Pickett's funeral. Yeah. yeah. And that was just completely normal to us. Yeah. We didn't, we, we had no idea that, you know, we were so different to the rest of the country. Well, we always considered East Wall to be an island because it was bounded by the river, the Talca, the boundary wall and the railway line. You know, and you could go no further other than, than the docks. Mm -hmm. off towards whatever Limerick or Liverpool I should say or whatever you know but it was it was a confined space and a lot of people in the locality uh, grew up together and knew each other well you know and, and uh, there, there wasn't any kind of uh, uh, difficulties uh, in the locality you know it was very much uh, everybody pulling together you know uh, same time uh, just uh, on that point about um, the lack of sectarianism Mm -hmm. It's a lot of it is kind of down to there was the Presbyterian minister in Clonturf was a man called David Love Morrow. He had originally been the minister to the congregation in Gloucester Street Presbyterian Church, who then moved out to Clonturf because they wanted to have their own school. And they moved out to Clonturf in the 1890s. But his attitude was your religion is your own concern. It's up to your own conscience, but that religious ministers needed to represent their communities as well as well as they could and actually the good of the whole community. And the way he brought everyone together was on the golf course. He was Ireland's golf king and he was responsible for the setting up of something like 16 golf clubs around the country. But he taught Catholic priests how to play golf. He taught Church of Ireland ministers how to, how to play golf. And they plotted, plotted and schemed on behalf of their communities yeah. on the golf course and got people that they were trying to influence out in the golf course with them and attended to succeed. He was, also, he was also the man who organized the first reading of the Quran 
in a place of worship in Ireland in 1890 mm -hmm. in Gloucester Street Presbyterian Church. He was very open-minded. Mm -hmm. Just see Katrina's muted at the minute, so I Sorry, can see No, it. my dog was barking. Sorry, Sorry. about that. Um, Helen previously has, has her hand up, so if you can set yeah. it to a mute. Yeah. Hi, how are you? Uh, I'm here, Helen Young, and I'm here with my mom, Maura, and my mother's grandfather was one of the original St. Barnabas Gardens tenants. Um, and we still have family live in Barnabas Gardens, so we reckon that we probably have maybe the longest connection with Barnabas Gardens of anyone represented here, given that they were original tenant and we still are there. And in fact, my aunt would have been the one who unveiled that plaque that um, Ruth referred to earlier um, at the entrance to St. Barnabas Gardens. So needless to say, my mother here has wonderful memories. Um, my great grandfather would have been a Protestant, um, as was my grandfather. But he married a Catholic and so they're for converted and so that whole spirit of ecumenism that you're all referring to is probably something that you know certainly our family would be very familiar with um, I would have great memories of going down to visit my grandmother from the time I was born and always struck me as a great place of great community and um, still so even even to this day going down to visit my aunt there's a great sense of community down there even with all the new people who've moved in um, I will say, Ruth, thank you very much for your presentation. I have a huge interest in this whole thing. I, I'd love to hear you talk about Herbie Sims, for example, who's another person I think is hugely, um, you know, unsung in the, in the story of, of housing in Dublin. But Callan Hall was such a, a great character, and I, and I reckon there are so, so few people who know anything about him. So I think thanks to you and Katrina and Joe and everybody else associated with the history group for bringing him, not just, you know, remembering him, but bringing him to life for those of us who have been visiting Barnabas Gardens from the time we were, were born, but never actually realised that it's a fantastic history. So, um, now my mother could keep you here for about four hours talking about her life in Barnabas Gardens. <laughs> but what she did want to know, Ruth, she's too shy to ask. Okay. If she remembers Scotch buildings and wonders, what was there, was there, a, you know, a Scottish connection? She's always wondered about, was there a connection with Scotland or something that led to those buildings and caused Scotch buildings? They're on, are they on Central Garden? No. Shipyard. Oh, Fairfield Avenue. Yeah. And also the Saint Church in Abbey Street. It's, oh, the, sh it's the shipyard. Pardon? The, the shipyard sh is the connection. Oh, okay. oh the shipyard. They're based, they were built for shipyard workers and they're based on a design that at one stage was very, very common around the back of Glasgow Rangers football ground oh. and in the Fairfield area and there's another area but they're, they're the other side of the river Clyde yeah. but they were very very common there and it was so the workers would feel at home because a lot of the skilled workers came over from Fairfield in Glasgow I have learned that then after all these years wondering how they came about being at the end of Fairfield Avenue thank you very much <laughs> Thanks. That's okay. Thank you, Rose. Thank you, Ruth. Helen, would your mum like to share any stories about growing up in Barnabas Gardens? Yeah. Oh, or, sorry, or Stryford Gardens, was it? No, she was in Barnabas Gardens. Yeah. Barnabas, so they, yeah. Bar yeah, yeah. Holbert was her was her maiden Helen, name. Helen. You were Helen's sister. Helen's I, sister, I exactly. Am her, yeah. I am her sister. Exactly. Laura. So that's why we say we think Helen is probably the, Helen. you know, she'd be the you know the her, her family would have the longest connection of the people who are who are living there now yeah so if you know Helen, this is more this is more her older her older but equally young looking sister <laughs> yeah. Hello, and I, have to, I have to add you mentioned hubert fuller hubert um got our choir going we i was always in the church choir on the little church on church road and um hubert was very interested in a mixed choir so he, um, he approached some of us to go into the choir, which was called uh, St. Joseph's Choral Society. And we used to practice in the little tin hut, as you're calling it. And we actually won the International Choral Festival in Cork in 1959. Woohoo! <laughs> 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 
And I'm sure that's not printed in this one. <laughs> now there you go. There you go. You can, have, you can have a song to finish off now if you want. <laughs> you'd remember, you'd remember Miss Gray. I yes. do indeed. And they were the caretakers of Barnabas Church. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we, we, Douglas Gray was the caretaker. Miss Gray lived on Barnabas Gardens, as did Violet and May, who never got married. Married, that's right. Yeah. And yeah, and we used to call around because you know the Protestants were great bakers, the Protestants women. Yes. Yeah. The tray and so bakes. The tray bakes, the Protestant women baked on a Sunday, and you could always get cakes in Protestant houses on Sunday. So we'd go around to Barnabas Gardens and we'd say to Violet, or, We've called around to visit Miss Gray and they bring us in. We always got, we did, we did get the cakes really. But I remember she lived to be a hundred. Yes, and she, we always refer to her as Miss Gray. Miss yeah, Gray, Ms. that's Gray. what it was. Yeah. 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 But funny, uh, are you Mary or Andy? I know I heard your name. Andy, I'm Angie. Angie. Yeah, but so my mom's father was actually a baker, as was her grandfather. So the reference earlier to the fact that the people who went into the houses first had a trade yeah. would be true in the case of in my mum's grandparents, you know, because both her yeah. grandfather, her father was a baker, her brother was a baker. There was that, you know, it continued on in the family. But he was a journeyman baker, as he was referred to, because he had come over from actually had come from England early on, her grandfather. So we always think there's probably a great story there as to the how yeah. and the why. Yeah, but you'd be right to say so. Therefore, yeah. Well, whatever about the women, my my grand my my great grandfather or my grandfather would have baked your tray bake while you were at it. So you could have called <laughs> number eight your tray bake. <laughs> you know, Sunday Sunday was the traditional baking day. Okay. Yeah. 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 And again, uh, to add before I go, um, we were collectors for the present church that is in East Wall now, uh, with Father Highland. You would have remembered Father Highland. And I used to collect on Faith Hope and Stony Road on a Sunday morning. There you go, would, would so, you have known Claire Carberry? I would have known Claire Carberry, yeah. No, there you go, Essna is asking that. My aunt. There you go. Hello. Hello, <laughs> that would be my aunt, and she did a lot of work for the church as well with Father Highland. So she would it. have, she would, would have. Saved the work. She worked in textiles. Yes. Up at the church road. Yes. And she did a lot of work with the girls, you know, doing things for sales of work and different uh, fundraising for the church. With Mrs. Lloyd. I'm with Mrs. Lloyd. <laughs> Oh, it could go on forever. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, as I say, fond memories, and that's what life is all about. Yeah. And actually, too, too often, he Helen is actually listening into this, Ethna, and, and you'll see the reference there to Betty McSweeney as being one of the people listening in, and that she's also, she would have been, um, she's Helen's sister, so she was Betty Hulbert. So you have three Hulbert sisters uh, listening in now this evening because... You know, this for their family is a big event, you know, the hundred years and to think that their, their grandfather was the well, was one of the first tenants. Yeah. So that's yeah. a it's a big thing for their family. Yeah. So we're delighted that you did this and we really feel very grateful that we were able to join in and it's wonderful to hear um you know to know that so many people are so are, are so interested, you know, because it is a fantastic story, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And I loved the photograph that accompanied the picture you have up on your on your website of the Barnabas Gardens in the 1920s with, a, with a, a, an old car in, in number six, I think. I mean, that was a great picture as well, too. Yeah, great to have those old images, the gas lamp. I, 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 I'm sure um, maybe we can put Ruth in contact with some of you um, afterwards. I'm sure she'd love to find out some more about life in, life in, in the utility houses. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, very yeah. interesting. Uh, Rip, yeah, that'd be yeah, great. And do you remember there were also dances in the Nissan hut? Oh, definitely. Oh, no, we yeah. only want clean stories. We only want clean stories. <laughs> that's, that's, how, that's, how, that's how our choir began. Oh. It kind of started with dancing. And then uh, Alfie McGowan, who was our choir man, said, no, we're here solely to sing. So then after a while, the dedicated singers stayed while the dancers moved away. They moved to, um, <laughs> um, do, you, do you remember Mrs. Capani from Stanford Gardens? 
Doreen Thank Capani. You. She was Doreen Fitzgerald. Yes, yes. And they were original tenants too. Yes, yes. And that's where she met Mr. Caprani, was that he was from Stiles Road and his brother and himself came down for the dances. In the but it, it was that's a it. wonderful area to live in and grow up in East Road. And I've always yeah. said that. I'm on the south side now. <laughs> well, nobody's but perfect. I, I always say <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like a little bird. I have to go home. And once I, have, once I cross the Liffey, I'm home. Yeah. <laughs> Over this, that's back over this direction. That's this side. Mm. No, it's home, is it? Yes, I'm home. I yeah. Guess what say. I'm yeah. home. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Thanks again, ladies. Thanks, Thanks very much. Ladies. And, Thanks for it. It was fantastic. Great. and it was lovely to talk to you. And Helen is listening in, is she? Are we muted? Yes, she would be listening in with Betty. Yeah. Oh, hello, no, Helen. How are you, Helen? <laughs> Pina, that was uh, absolutely brilliant to hear all the reminiscence. Uh, it was amazing to hear the, the story of Cannon Hall. And again, I think as we realised 10 years ago, it's just incredible that the story isn't much better known out there. Really, it's such a big story that it's so, it, it should be much better. Um, so thanks for those reminiscences. It was brilliant. And I'm glad to see people reconnecting with your know, families they knew from years ago. But as you can see, Ruth does have um, does have other commitments. And it was brilliant that Ruth could uh, do this talk tonight. But I think we better start uh, wrapping up and letting her go. So um, Ruth, thanks for that. That was absolutely brilliant. And do you want to say uh, any final words? And then we, we'll call her today. And from everybody in the East Wall History Group, and obviously from the residents of former residents of the utility housing you can see the response thanks again that was absolutely brilliant it was an absolute pleasure uh, and thank you all for giving up your time to hear it uh, so thanks very much for coming along and for sharing your stories as well i loved hearing about them <laughs>